literal giants. Now this man I was debating with said, that doesn't mean literal giants, this means these guys were really smart, it means they had, no, the word giant in the Hebrew means big. In fact, Goliath was nine feet tall, and he was one of these, a byproduct of this. Now, why would God do two things? Why would he destroy all mankind except for eight people? And even, even after the flood, when Israel was fighting heathen countries, and I never understood this until I understood this point, he would tell the Israel to destroy countries, men, women, children, cattle, everything, annihilate them. Why would God say to do that? That always bothered me. The intermingling with the sons of God, the fallen angels, that's what was happening pre-flood. Satan was so infiltrating the line of Christ that God's plan would have been eradicated had he not done that. Because Noah was in the line of Christ, if you follow the genealogies. And he was the, his family was the only family on the earth not touched by this ungodly enemy. It makes it make sense why God had to go to those measures. And then after the flood, you saw giants also. And the Bible names at least 12 or 13 tribes of them. And it was even happening then. So God would tell Israel, okay, you're my people. This is it's happening again. Destroy them. Yes. So those angels still, the fallen angels were still around even after yes. God had destroyed the world with the flood. They came back and started marrying in again. Yes, but this time God was taking care of them through Israel. Yeah. Now, here's the scary but kind of cool part if you, if you like prophecy. I think that's happening as we speak today. They're still around. I don't know how it's manifesting itself. Satan learns things just like we learn things. Muffins out here. I'm sorry. Okay, it's fine. Um, she just wanted to be on TV. Okay. No, but we see so much ungodliness, and here's what's here's what's getting my interest: demonism and witchcraft in our society. Thank you to the Harry Potter and Charm series and things like that. Is now a good thing. Witches are good. And they're out here fighting evil for you. Yes. I was just about to say, we watched the Golden Compass last, last night. And I, I, I actually had to, to eventually just put the remote control down because I was pausing like every two minutes. I mean, it was just like every minute there's an object yeah. that yeah. could teach a child. But the, the world that they created in that story was man with his soul walking beside him, and the souls were called demons. Yeah. And in the were land were witches, and were witches good. were good coming to help. The cute little and animals. The demons were good. The demons were good. They're not seen And I mean, that's, I, I just, it, it was so blatant. I had to put the remote aside. Uh, after the first 10 minutes, I was talking And see, this watching. stuff is getting subtly, and that's why I don't think it's bad to let kids watch that if the parents know what to do with it. Can you imagine a little kid that doesn't know that demon means bad? Yep. And they say, and oh, I want a little demon. And then they go to Sunday school and the Bible saying demons are bad, and they just and watch the movie where that demon helps them. They the cutest, sweetest things. They were there goes story. the controversy. But yeah. now if you have a parent that says, right. you know what, here's how Satan's fighting. Yeah. This movie says demons are bad, but the Bible's good, but the Bible says they're bad. Yeah. Now you can use everything as a teaching tool. Just make sure you know how to teach it. I think that's where the weakness of Christian families come in. I was debating another man on the internet about Christian education, and I was taking the negative side that I don't think Christian education is bad, but I think it's hurt somewhat if you're not careful. If the parents, if the parents don't keep the spiritual focus as the leader spiritually and delegate the responsibility to the school, you're going to have a problem. Um, when I was a youth pastor, it never failed. I'm not sure why this happened. But I'd, kid, I'd, had, I'd had kids in public school up to the ninth grade, and they were my best kids, spiritually. They transferred to a Christian school, and they became some of my lit, lackadaisical, most lackadaisical Christians spiritually. Because they got caught up in the, the lazy mentality that is now personifying the church. That's why mom and dad, they're the key. Um, even in Northside, I had my daughter come home and say something the Bible teacher said. It was a substitute teacher, and I'm not sure who it was. I'm, but it was incorrect. So she came home, and I, I said, tell me everything you learn in the Bible. I want to know. And so I, I showed her in the Bible what the real deal is on that. So you got to be careful, even in a good school. I mean, 
I'm not going to delegate my responsibility to raise my kids spiritually to a church or a school. I'm sorry. That's my kids. God gave them to me. I hope that the church and the school can partner with me, and that is happening here to the most part. But I never, never can fall to that idea, I'm going to turn them over to the school, and I'm not going to be their spiritual guardian. I am their spiritual guardian. That's why I'm teaching these rules. Um, uh, whew, going quickly. Okay. <clears throat> you know, I'm going to have to... I think I'll be able to finish this. Okay, there's too many good things. I'm going to have to come back next week. Let me say a couple things right here. Go to 1 Peter 3.18. Um, so you understand the sons of God situation, okay? If you, if you study the Bible and believe what it says, there's no problem. But if you want to say, well, I don't think that's right, so I'm going to make up a doctrine that calls these sons of God uh, the, the line of Cain, I mean, if you read some of these guys, the way they've got to try to explain that, I mean, it confuses you and you get dizzy really fast. It's just a lot more, it's a lot easier just to believe the Bible and know what it says. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, there were in, were in few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, preserving judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood upon uh, the world of the ungodly. So we know that when, when Jesus went down and, and preached, he was preaching to the prisoners, now, you're going to, on, on, the, on, the, on the paradise side with the Old Testament saints that abided by their dispensation, and they resurrected when Christ resurrected. So that side's empty. But who he was preaching to were the fallen angels. Who, what happened is when the fallen angel took the form of a man and cohabitated with women, he had to die like a man. And when they died, they were locked up in a special place. We're going to look at that right now. Now, remember, go back in 2 Peter 2, 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, what was that sin? You got the fallen angels are still free. So who's he talking about? That's the fallen angels that took the form of man. If God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, that's not where the fallen angels are now that didn't take human form. They're free. They're ungodly, but they're free. And delivered them, these angels that sin are now delivered into chains of darkness to reserve into judgment. So they're chained up and bound until the day of judgment. And how do we know that's talking about the um, flood of Noah and the, the sons of God were angels? Look at Jude 1 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate, their celestial form, they left their celestial form and took the form of flesh but left their own habitation, celestial form, he hath reserved in everlasting chains and the darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as the Sodom, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, that's what the angels were doing, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So it's pretty clear, if we just believe what the Bible says, that the sons of God... Um, were fallen angels and then some of them decided to take the form of man because they were lusting after um, human women and the results of that union were giants and that's why the flood was brought and that's why God told Israel to destroy all of these countries men, women, and children because Satan was again trying to pollute the bloodline of Jesus Christ and then I'll say this the Bible is not hard to understand it's hard to believe when you can get to the place where you believe what the Bible says, understanding is not going to be an issue. But people will read... You, I mean, I, I'll have people watching on God too, and they'll think, this guy is a loony. He's crazy. But it's what the Bible says, and I believe it. And when you do that, God will give you more and more understanding as you go. And it does make a lot of things make sense. I always struggled with why God would destroy whole nations. Wow, God. And then when Kenny sat me down and started teaching me how to study the Bible, and I saw this principle, I went, now I understand. It makes perfect sense. 
He had to eradicate people that were trying to pollute the bloodline of Christ through Satan and his fallen angels. Okay, I know I threw a lot at you today, but we'll pray.